Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Modern SaaS Podcast. Today I have a very special guest, Moore Asulin. I've been following Moore and his advice on LinkedIn and Twitter probably for more than a year or two now. Um, always learning a lot, all things with demo, sales coaching, all things about that. Over the period, known him very well personally as well. And there's this topic that's pretty much everyone top of mind that how do we make sure that the win rates are higher in this market economy that, that we are seeing? People are struggling, sales reps are struggling. So I thought, why not invite more? Hey, more, welcome to the show. Appreciate it, Ithya. Thanks Looking, for having me. Absolutely. Excited to chat. Obviously, you're passionate about how do we run demos? How do we improve the win rates based on that? Uh, but I'm also going to go about the coaching practices, some of the advice that you give from the coaching, how people should run coaching internally, uh, letting other people help them as well. Mm. Um, and so there are quite a few other areas that I will also cover. So why don't we start with the key topic that I mentioned in this market economy, one of the things I'm observing both in Avoma, I've also talked to a lot of other founders, a lot of sales leaders, and this whole, in the last probably three to four, three quarters, especially with the market economics that we are seeing, win rates have been dropping, quota attainment has been at all time low. What's going on? Why do you think people are struggling in this economy, especially? Is there something about purely should we blame the market? Or is there some responsibility that reps and the sales leaders should be taking and few things need to change to handle and address this kind of the situation or experience there? currently experiencing? I think it's a little bit of both. Um, I think having been a VP of sales, now I'm not, and now I'm a founder, but having been a VP of sales and having to come up with forecasts and spending time with a CEO, I've seen the pressure of CEOs trying to build out forecasts to please mm. their, their board and their VCs. And the VP of sales essentially has to agree with that or else it, it's their job. Um, and so they have to play politics. And then once the sort of pretend they agree with these new forecasts, they then have to go to the sales team and say, hey, we have these numbers, you have to hit them or else. And these are a lot of them, a lot of times are inflated forecasts, very top down, not bottoms up forecasts. One of the big reasons why a lot of reps are missing quota because their quota mm -hmm. itself was unattainable to begin with. My mm -hmm. approach to forecasting would be a bottoms up approach with a little bit of a top down. So looking at historical data of what was the average win rates across the board for the last six to eight months? What was the average sales cycle? What was the average MR or AR across the board? And um, average that out. That should be sort of like your your base, your reference. Mm -hmm. And then when I say top down, add a slightly ambitious percentage on top of that. So mm -hmm. if let's just say a company, if we're talking like purely SMB, on average, you're closing a 10K MR every month on average for the reps, then that could be a low, a base for you your forecast, then I'd say, you know what? I want reps to hit 12K or 13.5K. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think the, the, the answer is partially bad forecasting and I blame the CEOs. Um, yeah. <laughs> and then the other part I think is the economy. I mean, yeah. I'm feeling it across the board. Even people like me, I'm, I'm a guppy compared to these big companies where because a client of mine has to, cr they're cutting their marketing spend by half yeah. And if they're cutting marketing spend by half, they're cutting everything else by half. Then yeah. it affects me. And then I look at my expenses. So like, all right, I'm not getting the income that I used to have. So let me see what I can cut. And then I cut some yep. vendor. And then that vendor is like, oh, crap. we have, And it has domino effect. So yep. you could blame both those things. And the third thing you can blame is lack of training, lack of enablement to the salespeople, mm. lack of coaching. Uh, there's a company, I won't say the name, very well-known company very big in the space that I spoke to one of the sales reps in confidence. And they told me that their manager has 16 reps under her. And the last time they had a one-on-one -on -one was a, 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 in the previous quarter. Um, That's crazy. And so, and, and even the, the managers that are coaching, a lot of times they don't even know how to coach. And then I talked to a lot of reps. I've spoke to reps the other day. He says, you know, well, I joined the company. I'm now an AE, but uh, there is no material. There's, they're like, Hey, go figure it out. So I think yeah. it's a, a blend of both of those, uh, both th th those three things. I, I love the way you said it's not just uh, if the reps are not hitting the quota, not meeting the numbers. Um, you're right. 
the primary responsibility, the leadership, um, both CEO, people like me, having these ambitious goals, or we commit something to the board, we need to be upfront and transparent on what's going on, what are we seeing, how many team members we have, and based on that, really have an attainable quota. Now, one question I would, I'll give you my other perspective since you brought that up. Um, when I obviously operated Avoma, we have been experiencing some of these challenges ourselves as well. And one of the areas that also comes down because in 2021 and the last couple of years we had seen there was the market was frothy. Uh, there was a lot of capital in the market. So mm. salaries were really, really high. People's expectations were really high. So, and when you think about the quota, there's also an inbuilt, some is, I would say, a little bit of uh, benchmark or formula. Okay, that's if this is your OTE going to be on target income, then based on that earnings, then this is how much your um, quota should be. So to your point, yes, we could reduce the quota, but then you're also looking at, well, how much are we paying the reps? Uh, the reps I've talked to when I was interviewing, a lot of people, when I'm reaching out to them or when they're in the inbound uh, hiring process, they will ask me the base right after the gate. How much is your, uh, and these are two, three-year people had insanely high level expectations. So I used to also feel that, well, I'm willing to pay you if you're willing to close this much quota or the number of deals. Mm -hmm. What in your experience should be, and this is again across the board, different size of industry. So I know the answer is not just one silver bullet answer. But what's typically the guidance for leaders like me to say that this is the multiple of quota attainment you should expect if you're paying this kind of base? Should reps think that the salaries that they were expecting in 2021 um, or 2020 as well were higher now and then the market should come to normalcy? If the quota needs to be reduced, should the comp needs to be adjusted or the expectations are itself wrong? The benchmarks that we see, the 3x and 5x and all of that stuff compared to that. How what changes have you seen there? I mean, I haven't I haven't been in the VP of sales role for about 18 months. Um, so I'll, I can speak based on my experience with the clients that I work with. Yeah. Um, so you're the question, I'm gonna repeat back the question to make sure I understood. If we're gonna readjust the quota to make it call it more attainable, more realistic, should the quota then go down or should the base plus commission go down? Is that the question? Yeah. What's the multiple that people should expect? If the comp is certain thing, there is an expectation that multiple of that quota. You can look at the quota from the wind rates and all of that. And you can say, well, last month we only closed this much. And so we can expect only this much. And that's the way of doing forecasting. But then you're also looking at when it comes on top down, my top down most of the time would be, okay, what's the comp? A multiple of it. What's the multiple of that? And this is what we should be expecting. Yeah, I, that's why I don't like a top-down approach. I think yeah. it was Mark. Uh, I can't. I, I can never pronounce his name. He was the zero, no, no, Kaz, Kazaglo. If I'm right. Oh uh, yeah, 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 the yeah, outreach one. Yeah, yeah. He he made yeah, a post Kazaglo. on uh, LinkedIn last week or two weeks ago about yeah, right the different models: top-down, bottoms up, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And as I was reading, I was like, I hope he doesn't say top-down is the right approach. And he didn't. He actually hate, hated <laughs> the top-down. That's why I don't yeah. like top down because it's all made up. Everything's yeah, it is. made up. And so quota is based on a multiple. And so it's unreal. It's just, actually, I don't like it. Um, if I were to be a VP of sales again, or far right recently, I just uh, uh, advised a company they were needing to do a better comp plan. I said, keep it really simple to understand for the salespeople and don't overcomplicate it. Just look yeah. at your performance for the last six to 12 months, it, it, you know, six to eight months, six to nine months. Reverse engineer that. How, how much money did the reps make on average from co on on commission on new revenue, mm -hmm. and then what's the fair base? Uh, what's the fair pay for a rep for a base salary in with their experience? Forty five k, fifty k, sixty k, whatever it is, and and that's and that should be your number. That is the most realistic approach to take. Mm -hmm. You can even get a little bit ambitious and put in an extra goal on it. Plus, if you have any accelerators where they exceed quota by. 125 percent or 50 whatever it is then you can have accelerators but i i like to keep it simple i think it, once you get into the whole multiple place it gets really complex and this is good advice yeah i think what's essentially you're suggesting is that um, a lot of the times we read these multiples that other leaders other people are sharing and then 
those multiples probably worked in some other industry or some other market period of time condition, yeah period of time and a lot of the times it's just looking at your own current state your own current financial situation uh, be fair as long as you be fair with the compensation have the data for past performance and yeah. then make sure that that's how you're setting the goals as well i'll Love tell it. you when i was when i was vp of sales and i was hiring one of the questions i asked up front i like to talk about money up front that's why yeah. there, the old school interview process we don't talk about money until the end until you're qualified yeah no it's, it's uh, yeah. yeah talk money talk about money up front to to not waste time so i would ask the reps hey what's your what, what is your expect what is your minimum what's your base i won't say what, what's your minimum what's your base pay what what is what would you like your ot to be and then i'll tell you what hours is and you let me know if that works for you i would say that right up front i would i, I would start actually putting it in the job description I, in the yeah. job description i would not hide what base pay is I would add what the base pay is, what OT is, what percentage of quota is, um, where the leads come from, what the average sale. I would put all of that in the job description. So the people that are actually applying are the ones that have read the job description and are probably highly qualified. 100%. Um, I love that. And so that's, that would be my recommendation. And then, yeah, I mean, it's, it's simple. It's, it's not complicated. No, I love that. So that's one thing we could change as a leadership. The second thing that you also mentioned, obviously there is element of the coaching and the reps probably not doing certain things right as well in this market. Um, one of the shifts I had seen when the markets were frothy, everything, the capital was there. There was a little bit of element of the buyers were also more forgiving. They were like, okay, I want to buy anything. They were not pushing as much back. And the reps were, in some sense, in an order-taking mode. Uh, yes, some reps would sell actively, but a lot of the times there was so much demand, so much was there, just show something and just buy it. What are the, one of the things I'm seeing right now, more competitors. So buyers are evaluating more providers. They're not just going with the brand name or sometimes they're not going with the cheapest. They want to really make sure that they're investing properly and then more objections are coming in uh, sometimes the concerns about the roi are also coming in if it's not apparent evident then you have to handle those objections so i'm seeing more and more the order taking days are pretty much gone what should then aes should do maybe in the discovery or demo maybe two or three things that were different that they did early on in this economy that now they have to absolutely nail these couple of things down what comes top of the mind the first thing that, that came top of mind is, and I, regardless of the economy, they should do this, but it's harder to do when you have so much demand, when people are like, take my money. Yep. Um, it's bringing up the FUD, the fear, uncertainty, and doubt. So in other mm. words, the objections that you know your prospects are thinking about, you as the salesperson, bring it up, call out the elephant in the room that you know is going to be called out later on. That's the first thing. Don't set up next steps at the end of the call. Set up next steps in the beginning of the call. And then number three, you find out or you validate the people that are in talks about like the decision maker. It's such a, I think a very outdated old school way of thinking about sales decision maker. I'll give you an example. You roll out of, you're talking to a VP of sales and you want to roll out a VOMA for their, for their sales team, right? Even though it's for CS, but let's just, we're going to go sales related right now. Now the VP of sales is going to say, Hey, you know, let's do a trial. And, and the VP of sales has frontline managers and some salespeople. And what their use case is, they want to make sure that the manager, it's easy for them to use when they, when coaching for the reps to use post demo or post discovery call to take the notes and put into Salesforce, whatever it is. Yeah. Now, who's the, who's the decision maker? By definition, it's that VP of sales, but really who's influencing the decision maker? It's really the salespeople and the manager. If the salespeople tell the manager, this sucks. And the manager yeah. says, wow, this sucks. The VP of sales decision is, this sucks. So I think we have to get away from seeing talking about decision makers and talking about the, I call them influencers. Who's influencing mm -hmm. the deal? Um, mm -hmm. If I'm going to uh, uh, buy a present for my son and he hates it, I'm going to return it, even though yeah. I'm the one that makes the decision. My son makes a decision, really. Um, no, I love that. And I yeah. think you, let's go deeper there. I love the initial part. Um, you mentioned the FUD, the fear, uncertainty, and doubt. How do people should should they just be prepared for that, or should they be asking about those? Hey, I know you're gonna the budget is constrained, or whatever it could be, uncertainty, or you're gonna probably evaluate. In our case, I might say, I'm sure you must be evaluating Gong and Chorus because if you're looking at so, why didn't you buy? 
yet or something like that. Is that, what's your recommendation that people should bring that in the conversation early on? And do you recommend this during discovery or uh, during the demo itself? During discovery, not the demo. Okay. Um, and if and some people are combining their disco and demo, so yes, during discovery. And I mean, so before bringing it up, I'd recommend for anyone to build out a buying scenario matrix, which is essentially what's the comp, what are the top common use cases that prospects are evaluating your your product. So mm. are they coming from a competitor? Are they coming from no solution, or mm. are they coming from a manual way of doing things? So mm. are you competing against Excel spreadsheets? Are you competing against Gong? Forest, et cetera, or are you competing against just recording it on Zoom and manually having to go back to the call? So first you have to build out these buying scenarios. Within each buying scenario, you have certain FUDs. A buyer, a, a, a VP of sales that's coming from a competitor buying scenario has a certain FUD. What's one of the FUDs? Feature parity. Can yeah. Avoma do what Gong does? What's another FUD? Is Avoma cheaper than Gong? Yeah. Three, is the support better? So they have certain funds. A person coming from a manual way of doing things, very manual, one of the first things that they t- that's top of mind is price. They've never used the software. So for them, any price is expensive. And so first thing I would say is build out your buying scenario sort of matrix. It's something that I do for my clients. And when, you are on, when, you're, when you're getting on a call, you have a call scheduled, by proper preparation, you'll know most of the time where your buyer falls. Are they following are they falling under new coming from competitor, new to solution, or using manual approach? When you get on the call, you can say something like, oh, so you're you're currently, you know, it looks like you're using Gong. Um, you know, it's funny, a lot of times I speak to uh, to uh, VPs of sales that have used Gong, and there are three things that's always top of mind for them. And it always comes up in conversations. And then I'd bring that up. Love that. This Which of amazing. those three resonates with you? Or which of those three um, seems to fall in your world? They may say all three or just one of them. Who knows? But I share that up front because of my research of the buying scenario. Oh, this is this is brilliant. The third thing, and it seems like it's um, one of the things that you said, knowing who the buyer is in front of you. And uh, rather than the pitch, typically one of the things, really try to understand who is in front of you and tailor it based on that. And more and more in this economy, don't assume everyone is going to have the same budget, same level of buying power. Uh, people are obviously different preferences, uh, but also different use cases, different budget needs, and how you really put them into those metric bucket. And you essentially recommend the way I see it, leadership, sales leader should, or whoever is, should help build this first, then educate this, coach this to your reps, but also have reps to also do their research. And this goes to my another thing, like during these kind of now, how much you believe that reps should um, you know, know their product in and out, know the details in and out in this economy. Is the expectation that reps should be product experts or are they bringing in sales engineer or somebody else to do the demos? Uh, because a lot of this, the confidence that you need to explain and handle these objections, do you always need other people to handle these? You can facilitate some of these conversations, but do you think that have you seen a shift where reps are knowing in terms of the product and has that correlated to better win rates? Or do you believe that, no, you still need the discovery is handled by rep, <clears throat> but the demonstration and some other objections are handled by somebody else? Hmm. Um, and so what, what have you seen in the industry change in the last, let's say, 18 months? I don't want to make a blanket statement, but I hate when salespeople or companies have a solutions engineer or sales engineer do the demo for multiple reasons. Number one, the sales engineer doesn't isn't carrying a quota like a sales rep is. Yeah. The sales engineer doesn't have a relationship with the prospect like the sales rep is. The sales engineer is this there to facilitate, but they're not their job is not to close more revenue. It's just to help the sales rep. So they're not as in, they don't have the same incentive and they care less. And so the demos are going to be subpar. And many of them don't know true discovery and they don't use the discovery notes. And so I'm very anti sales engineer. As someone that's leading the demo, I'm very pro sales engineer as someone that sort of is a tool for the sales rep to pull out whenever they need uh, to talk something really complex. Now, that being said, I don't necessarily think that the initial demo should be technical. The initial Mm. demo should be a trailer to a movie where Mm. it's so good, the trailer is good enough for you to say, I want to go watch that movie. 
So if you do a really good job of doing a demo sort of at like a high level with some specific use cases based on the prospect, that's good enough for the prospect to say, let's schedule a secondary demo, a more technical demo where we'll loop in our sales engineer or sales consultant, whatever it is. So I'm sort of, I'm giving you two answers. That's one, one, one initial thought. The second thought is, I think if you know the product in and out, you're, you're going to perform better. You're going to have better win rates because if you don't know the product, then it, there's a lot of, I'll get back to you conversations. Yeah. And then that creates a longer sales cycle and time yeah. kills deals. And that's a problem. So I would encourage your reps to actually learn the product in and out. But one of the best ways to learn the product in and out, and I don't know many companies that do this, but every time I hire it, I would do this, is part of your onboarding should have reps sitting on support tickets and answering support tickets mm. and sitting on onboarding calls and maybe doing a handful of onboarding calls initially. Mm. Because that's where the bulk of like the in and out, the technicality of the software really comes out, not on the demo, really on the support, because that's where they're trying to accomplish a particular use case. They need to loop in CS, customer success, et cetera. So that is a way for a rep to do uh, to be a product expert. If you're a contractor or a GC, or a real estate agent, et cetera, there's a concept called continuing education. Every two years, you mm-hmm. do it. There should be a continuing education within the entire org every quarter for every department to review the product, to review uh, the buyer persona, to review all those things again, sort of like a, a, a test um, versus just onboarding and then we forget about it and then they have yep. they're, on, they're on their own. Um, now if a rep doesn't have the necessary sales skill sets, then leaning into your product knowledge can compensate for the lack of skills, uh, sales skill sets, but product knowledge, I mean, is always great. I think even better if you have industry knowledge, if you know exactly what the buyer's thinking and how they're thinking, and you understand the world, because ideally if you were in that world, yeah. then you'll win. For example, if I were to ever sell a Voma, I'd probably be your best salesperson because I was I'm a VP. I was a VP using something like Avoma. My clients use Avoma, and I use Avoma for them. I can talk the talk, walk the walk. I'm I'm a user of it, and yeah. so I so if you understand the industry, you'll have also a crazy edge over the comp- competition. I love this. There is one thing you said um, that resonated the whole thing that you want. You know, the buyer experience today's buyer experience, the modern buying experience. We still see that they go through this book a discovery call. And then you only do discovery. And so some junior PDR, SDR will come in and will try to qualify you. What I loved what you said that, hey, don't give the first demo as a full technical demo. Maybe it's a trailer. So with that, the buyer is also finding some value. The current mode that I'm seeing, even it's 2023, we still have a lot of companies who would ask you to just talk to SDR, BDR to qualify you. Mm. And then you will see the demo after two weeks. And the process, the way you mentioned early on, also that some companies are combining the discovery and demo together, disco demo as they call. And in that, the way to think about it would be rather than having a dedicated discovery and also rather than having a dedicated demo completely, maybe you combine that there is maybe 15, 20 minutes of discovery, but you're still giving some insight. Maybe it's not fully tailored. Maybe it's not fully all functional, but giving them a little bit of in the return, you're asking them some information, you're giving them some Mm. your key preview or trailer showing them. So they feel that they have seen the demo, but not you have not shown them. You have to constantly tell them that this is not the full demo. I'm going to show you one quick thing, but we can take this later on. We'll schedule another demo. And that might reduce this pressure that people who are doing pure discovery, it seems like that if they bring in a little bit of the trailer element to that, then buyers will not feel like, oh, I have to go another discovery and this is just, interrogation, them asking me all these questions and trying to learn about everything and without showing me anything. Um, we win a lot of customers because in our industry, that still happens a lot. And customers are frustrated that before they get to see the demo, they already set up in Avoma. And mm. so I see that if a modern, have you, do you recommend this to you when your clients are, hey, reduce this number of steps and maybe this will provide a better buying experience? Because you have been buyer also, you go and buy certain software what frustrates you what's the modern buying experience that you think that people want today there's, so there's a lot of from the top of funnel that i'm seeing in the last two weeks i've been sort of like auditing a few clients' websites mm-hmm. from like a if i were the prospect what am i seeing so they have and this is very common they have mm-hmm. the main call to action on the website is schedule a demo so mm-hmm. you click on schedule a demo you fill out your information thank you we'll reach out to you mm-hmm. i thought i was scheduling a demo i thought you're 
by by definition, scheduled demo means I'm able to just pull up the Calendly and book my and my time. Book a, yeah. And so, and then, and then when you have that little thing, you will reach out to you. This will be a discovery call. I'm like, hold on, what? I wanted a demo. So there's a huge disconnect from what the buyer wants and what the what the company wants. So um, I've seen I've seen that across the board for well known companies too. And then what happens? You get an autom- you get an email from the SDR that says, "Hey, more blah blah blah." Uh, if we spend 15 minutes just to learn a little bit more about your call, so they block out actually 30 minutes on the calendar. And I've done. I went through the whole flow. I get on the I get on the call, the discovery demo call, whatever you want to call it, the discovery in their definition. Yeah. And my calendar is now officially blocked for 30 minutes. It's like, oh, so we'll brought you over to our company, blah blah blah. They ask maybe one or two questions. It's like, okay, so I'm going to set you up with our account executive executive to do a demo. That entire call took five minutes. I blocked out 30 minutes on my calendar. There was actually no discovery. They just wanted to make sure I'm a real person. And now I have to wait for a what a shitty buying process. Wow. And um, they're making it really. They're, they're, it's funny companies, and I tweeted this the other day. Companies are trying to improve salespeople's ability to sell when they should make they should really improve or make it easier for the buyer to buy. Buyers don't want that. They again, it depends how complex. If it's a let's just say a 200k plus deal, they may not want a full fledged demo. The buyer probably wants to also understand if this is a fit, but they at least want a taste of. Hold on, I, I need to visually see. I need to conceptualize it. Um, but the whole top of it's all broken from the top of I'm seeing it left and right. Plus there's another one that I saw yesterday. Schedule a demo. I'm like, okay, great. So I go to schedule a demo, it takes me down to a form. There's about seven fields that I have to fill out. The first three to four fields definitely showed it. It was the first name, last name, business email, and phone number. And and side note, a lot of companies are not putting phone number as a requirement as a field when they should, because if you don't, you're limiting your follow-up to just email. And that's just gonna destroy the follow-up process and kill your deal win rates. You want a phone number, you want it required. And so I filled it out and then I clicked next. It takes me to a Calendly page. I'm like, all right, great, Calendly. I pull up, <laughs> I put up my I, I schedule a date and time. What happens? Part of Calendly is a form that pops out with five Again, more same fields. Questions. <laughs> five more fields. First name, last name, email, oh company God. name, phone number. I'm like, and it's not even pre-filled. It has to fill it out again. So I'm going oh through God. this flow all over. I'm like, oh my gosh. And then they complain, hold on, MQLs are down. SQLs are, why, why are the reps not hitting quota? We're not getting cut marketing. It's not working. No, it is working. Your whole sales funnel is not working. This is, I, I don't know, I mean, more. This is one of the bizarre things I see. Like, you know it, I know it. We are buyers most of the times. We talk about it. A lot of people talk about it. But we are still not seeing the change in the industry. And that really bugs me around that. Why the heck these processes are are still the way it is still run today? Why people are not understanding the way the buyer has changed? We need to simplify. We talk about it. A lot of gurus talk about it on this on LinkedIn. But companies are not changing. And I'll give you my personal example here. We were seeing massive influx of demos and trials and all of that stuff to a level where reps are not able to handle it. Then we started saying, well, there are, yeah. and when our, we allow people to just with minimal information, book it, schedule it to your point. Like we don't ask too many questions. And the one change we realized that, well, the no-shows have increased a lot in our, uh, so there's a different thing that we had to do. Well, our reps were not handling the meetings that were booked on calendar. And then we can go into that. I know you have shared, how do you, no-show reduction is that, how do you engage with them pre-meeting itself? Um, and there's a lot we can talk about that. So we started doing that. But another thing we looked at, hey, how do we also make sure that the right buyers are also there who are committed to some extent? Can we add some friction by design? Not too much. If you, It's it's a spectrum, right? If you don't have any, spec, any mm-hmm. friction, random people are coming and checking in. If you have a slight bit of friction, then yes, you have a little bit of commitment from there. We added just one field, uh, phone number. The number of demos that was it required? Booked, it's a required field, and it just became half right after that. Sure. So one field it reduced our number of demos booked by half, uh, but at the same time it also reduced um, our no shows significantly. So now everyone who is there is still a lot more committed. But we were very careful of not overflowing it with twenty other form fields the way you said. Uh, so you're right. I mean, I think 
I do think about this experience like every form field where questioning should be added or not. And then people have these 10 fields, seven fields, and you have to enter it twice. Oh gosh, I mean, I don't know why people yeah. are thinking of these experiences. I mean, I, I'd recommend it if you want to make it frictionless for the buyer to to book a demo and you're like, oh, I don't want to do the whole form field off the bat. They're going to see it. They're going to get turned off. It's not complex. What you do is a couple of things. Number one, the main field on, so you imagine you have like a landing page or your website, schedule a demo. What you should have is only one field and that's your email field. That's it, just yeah. an email field. Have them fill it out. You click on next, it then pops out. And then there's a flow, sort of like a type form, right? And then the next, and it just pops out another question, first uh, name or first name. And then you click next. And then it has like three other, two other remaining fields that you want to fill out, uh, phone number and company name, and then the calendar. Um, so at, the reason why that works also is because initially the, all the, the buyer or the lead sees is the email. Fill. Oh, the email for, yeah, yeah easy. that's easy. They fill it out. They already now have an, an easy experience. So they trust the experience that they're about to approach. And you can just add two more fields as a pop-up, pre-fill the email so they don't have to refill it again, have yeah. the Calendly, and that's it. I love this. I love this. And even the way you said some of the fields can be enriched by the data enrichment tools. Like you get the email send the request to Apollo, clear bit, and get the phone number and some additional information so that I don't even have to fill that. that that's even magical experience for me. Yep. Oh, wow. You already know me. You already filled it out. I don't have to deal with the company name. All these are basic information. All these data yeah. providers are there. I'm noticing um, it now. There is, yeah. there is, and, and I, I know, I think I know why it's happening. The, on a, a demo request form or a contact sales form, there is, they require a company email address. And then they also, on the next line, they put a field for company name and it's a requirement. Huh? I've, if I work at more at avomo.com, well, isn't avomo.com the company name? And so why exactly. not enrich that field? HubSpot does it when you fill out an email, it yeah. enriches the company name. Why not do yeah. that? Yeah. So I think uh, even we now, I'll go back and have another action item to simplify our demo booking experience even more. Now, Going deeper into the demo experience. So one of the things I, I know you're passionate about, you started from demo to close, purely focus on the demo experience that the rep should be doing. And uh, it's what... slightly changed since then. <laughs> Tell me more. What what has changed then? Yeah. yeah. So initially it was like that. That was like, I want to niche out to demos. But yeah. realistically, most folks aren't doing one call closes. And yeah. the increasing of deal rates doesn't just happen from a demo. It happens from the preparation of a call, the discovery the demo, the post demo, everything surrounding it. The demo mm -hmm. is just one little tiny stage of it. Um, and essentially that's what I teach, but I think it doesn't come off like that because it's just demo too close. But yeah, so that's, it's everything surrounding the demo, including the demo. So given your coaching and consulting experience, what is the common three things that you keep teaching again and again to reps that you see that they're missing? Um, maybe in a virtual world demo, like on remote meetings what are the few common feedback that you end up giving here are the three things that you have to nail down no matter what these are like do not compromise on these three things what would be those from just uh, from a demo perspective or from, from a demo our, perspective from an overall like deal perspective let's start with demo and then if there's correlates to deal we can go there as well let's start with the demo yeah um demo demo prep um understanding the buyer persona on the buying scenario those are two important mm -hmm. things and so the buyer persona, who are you talking to and who's within like their department as well? And what, is it, what otherwise you're going to get on the call and be like, so tell me about your business, which is mm -hmm. a very silly question to ask. Mm -hmm. um, tell them what you already know about their business and try and show them what you've learned and show them how you've connected the dots versus mm -hmm. having them do the work for you. So that's demo prep. The other one is it's going to, it's like beating a dead horse, but the discovery, um, mm -hmm. You need to know the pain. That's the first thing. You need to know the size of the pain. Essentially, on a scale of one to ten, ten being buildings on fire, we can't survive. Otherwise, we have to. We're going to implode. Where does that pain fall in that spectrum? Because that pain will determine the level of urgency you can pull as a way to close them. Um, third is who's affected by that pain. Most of the time, it's not just that one person. It's other people in the department or other departments. And uh, fourth, when do they want to start solving that pain by? Like. When does that pain need to be completed by or start processing that that pro that solution? Um, those are like the minimum criteria as part of like the discovery. Uh, so that's essentially the what's the challenge, 
what's the impact of that, right? What are the consequences? Yeah. Who are the stakeholders? That's a essentially, and what's the timeline? Four main things that you need to find out before even doing the demo. Um, and then as far as the third thing, as far as the demo goes, you're going to pri- you're going to prioritize the features that solves their their biggest problem. So if they have five challenges that you've learned from discovery, part of your job is to get them to prioritize those five. Like what's number one? What's number two? What's number three? Then when you do the demo, you're essentially taking challenge number one on the top of their list, and you're going to map that to the feature that solves that problem. Yeah. And then you get, you're going to do that for the next one and the next one. Yeah. I love this last piece where mapping into the problems. I've seen demos, even with some of the reps that we had hired in Ovoma, and I had to correct it very quickly in one of those situations. And when I also see sometimes uh, try to take demos of other prospects um, or other vendors, one of the things that they do. So sometimes reps will go in the settings mode and they'll try to, here is what you do, how you set up your oh, account. I can't, sta- I can't stand that. I'm like, I don't need to know the details, bells and whistles. How do I, what is the get started thing and the steps and the settings? To your point, the trail, that analogy works really well, that give me the trailer based on those two problems, pick one or two problems and then ask me, which problem do you have? Let me show you how do I solve that problem in this workflow. Yes, your products are comprehensive. You have lot of stuff and we are seeing that right now. You can't cover every single thing in that, 30, 20 minute demo that you want to do, you probably need more time. But uh, yeah, you're right. I mean, starting from the problems and really trying to give that aha moment, wow moment in those first two things. You can do all the settings part in the onboarding part and you can always call out that, hey, if you ask questions, I'll show you. But why you are going and starting with that experience itself? Like it was kind of a feature dump was all over the place. It was crazy. I think... So reps that even would follow that framework will say, okay, well, then I'm just going to start showing them the features that solve their problem. And then they just go into the features. But my my suggestion to them, my sort of my challenge to them is don't just talk about the features, even though if that feature solves that problem, you need to make it so obvious about, you have to almost like narrate what you're doing. Narrate mm-hmm. the demo yourself, not just narrate the features, but I'm not, I'll give you an example. Um, Let's just use Avoma for example, and a VP of sales is evaluating Avoma because there's no way he's right now he doesn't have access to listening to the reps calls. Let's just say we'll keep it simple. Yeah. Let's say that one of the features would be um, the call recording and the transcription, right? Yeah. So as a VP of sales, as a, if I were selling Avoma, I would say, give an example, like, hey, VP of sales, you said earlier that you don't have access to uh, the, the calls that they have. It's a very manual approach. You have to manually like jump in through Zoom and it's you need to see the transcription of what they said and how they said it. Um, so what I'm about to show you will allow you to actually do that thing that you wanted to do. And I'm, I'm literally telling them what I'm about to do and why I'm about to do it. I don't just show it to them and make them mm. and hope that they realize why I'm showing it to them. I'm, I'm not relying on that. I'm, I'm being really exclusive with it. You're basically literally taking them, guiding them and helping them imagine the world. It's an imaginary world they are envisioning what's that state is going to be because people buy things for a better version of themselves. Um, and so you're, it's a promised land, it's a dream land, which is real. And you're saying that, hey, you are here and I'm gonna, let's take you to the tour of your better version that you're gonna see. And then you guide them. This is how the life would be much better. Yeah, it's like, I'll tell you, when I, whenever I go traveling um, anywhere, um, I open up a Google sp- uh, spreadsheet and I mm-hmm. list items of my, what I'm going to pack. And mm-hmm. then I usually it's on my phone. So then I'll go to my suitcase and I say, I look at the first thing on the spreadsheet, like, okay, number one socks. Okay. So I got to get socks. I go to the closet, pick out socks, mm-hmm. throw in two socks. All right. I said, I needed two socks. I packed two socks. Check. That's essentially what I'm doing on the demo. I'm being very, mm-hmm. like, I'm talking it out. You said you needed this. Let me show you how to do that. Boom. Does that work? Good. Next. I'm saying this all out loud on purpose to show the prospect that I'm, I'm, we're mapping it to, I'm, I'm, I'm taking you by hand and I'm showing you how to do this versus just it. saying, Hey, let me show you this feature. This feature does this, this, and that. And hoping that they understand why I'm showing that. I'm telling them why I'm showing it to them. Not just the narrative part is the big one that telling them, guiding them constantly that this is what you're going to see next. This is what I'm showing you right now. And this is why I'm showing this to you. Yeah. Correct. The why is the important piece as well. Right. The what, the feature itself is, 
the actual what you say on the feature, not the biggest deal. It's the why, it's the narrative before that and after. And the way I would say that you can go deeper into the what and other uh, the details of it, but let them ask it. First, make sure that they're excited about to go into that detail. And then if they ask more questions, that's great. And then you can continue to go and show more details, but don't throw before you ask all those questions. Um, so I love that. Yeah. Um, one of the things that you also had mentioned early on was the uh, the reason we said, hey, why the close rates are lower, the attainment is lower. Uh, the third bucket that you mentioned was the coaching. And there's a lack of coaching, uh, both not either continuous coaching is not also there. Some managers don't even have one-on-one -on -one schedule. If you look at it, what's happening also in the world, uh, on LinkedIn especially or YouTube, there is so much knowledge that's free knowledge that's being shared. Sales coaches like you, experts like you who are sharing advice based on your experience. I can, I'm learning. I was an engineer by trade. Everything I've learned in sales is by watching people like you, following your advice, reading some books. And so sometimes I feel that what is stopping reps to learn these things on their own and really be have the drive to grow and have that demonstrate that growth mindset. But at the same time, we question that, well, this rep does not know it, so I have to coach on every single thing. Or at least the product coaching, I get it because that's unique to your world, the industry knowledge unique to your world. But other than that, the sales skills, the basic talent, basic knowledge. So how much do you believe is the responsibility of manager or leadership to coach the reps? And how much you believe now and is is it shifting? Is it? I mean, again, you might say 50-50, Aditya. Both those, the reps should be responsible to do get better, um, and at the same time, managers should also take some responsibility. But I'm seeing the gap here. The reason is that sometimes the reps are not either driven, and then on the other hand, the managers are not driven. Why this gap is still exist? I wouldn't necessarily say 50-50 first. I would say if you're the if you're the sales rep and you're listening to this, then assume that it's 100% your responsibility. Mm. And then if you're the manager listening to this, then assume it's 100% your responsibility. I love it. I love it. So then you're both going in responsible. So I love it. <laughs> um, and that's how I was when I was an account executive and I had a, my, my CEO at the time guiding me and all that. I went in assuming it's 100% my responsibility. So it's, it's, kind of, it's accountability. Um, yeah. I think... Why it's not happening, a lot of times managers either one, don't know how to coach, um, they don't have the time to coach, or they don't think it's as important because they're like, we hired top reps, so they should know how to do it. And reps are going in, and some of them are, they're not as ambitious, and they're okay making whatever they're making. And so that's one reason. Or two, they don't even know what they don't know. Like, they don't even know where to start. Yeah, we have access to free information everywhere now, but it's, it's overwhelming. It's like, where do I even start? Like, who do I, it's like, you know what? It's just easier not to do anything. Yeah. And um, so I think that's the other issue. Do you see the resistance from some reps who are successful? They had been successful and, uh, but the world is also changing. We talked about the modern buying experience and uh, some of these new trends that we are saying, you should not do these things in the demo. Some rep, reps, senior reps who have been successful in the past, the way they have been selling might show resistance. When you do coaching and consulting, do you see that happens? And then how do you convince people that even though you have been successful in the past way of doing certain things, you still need coaching. You still need to learn these new things. How do you convince them that why they need? And then how do you get the buy-in from the reps itself? Like, okay, yeah. it's okay to get me feedback even though I've sold so much. It depends on, on, on the landscape. So if you're in a position right now where you're hiring reps and you or you're maybe early stage startup, you don't have any reps, or you're hiring new ones and you want to sort of blank slate, then part of the interview process is to look for coachability. Because mm -hmm. without that, then you're going to mm -hmm. end up dealing with a rep that has an ego. And so that's more of a preventative approach. But mm -hmm. if you're right now in a position where you have reps, you have like your top three reps, whatever it is, and they don't seem that coachable, um, then you mm -hmm. have to ask yourself, am I willing to want to keep them? Um, and if I am, then then you have to either suck it up and like, that's what it, it is, what it is, or mm. um, you have to coach them differently. So usually the reps that have been performing well, they don't need the same type of coaching that you would give someone that isn't performing. And they, they need different type of support, different style mm. of coaching. And that's so I, I wouldn't go into coaching as like, since, you know, we want to coach discovery, I'm going to coach everyone on discovery. 
No, no. if the reps, if the top reps are hitting their quota and above quota, don't go in trying to change the way they're they're closing. They're doing a good job. Go in maybe a different strategy, how to how they can use their brand to generate more leads because they don't have a closing problem, they have a lead problem. Who knows? Um, so I would contextualize the coaching based on I love your, this advice. Your coaching. I love this. No, this is phenomenal. So the even as a manager, don't make coaching program common for all. That's when reps will yeah. probably lose the trust that for hey, sure. why the heck they're asking me to do things that I don't need. Make it personalized. That's yeah. what you're saying. Yeah. I'll give you an example. There's a, I have a client right now. They have 13 account executives, three of which, no, probably four of which are like, sure, more coaching would be helpful, but knowing they're, they're hitting their quota and above quota, they're doing well, they're carrying the team, um, which is not necessarily the best thing, but they're carrying the team. Um, yeah. And so I stopped coaching them in the same frequency as I coached the other reps. So instead of every week or every other day, I'm coaching them maybe once or twice a month. And mm. it may be only 15 minutes of like coaching feedback. And then the rest of it is more like deal strategy. We'll, we'll like talk, we'll go over a deal that they're working on and try to figure out a game plan to like move the deal forward. So it's not like, hey, you needed this, you should have said this differently. We talk, like we come up with a game plan. The other reps that are not performing, they're not ready for the deal strategy. They need the fundamentals. They need to ask better questions. They need to ask, you know, ask for the close or set up next step. We'll work on that. So contextualize it. I lower the this. frequency, lower the uh, or change and and change what you're coaching. You don't have to coach. You don't have to coach the call. You can coach the deal. It's two different things. That's awesome. We're coming close to here. I have two questions that I really want to ask. One of the things I've seen you say multiple times that call recording tools, intelligence tool like us, and you you believe that just having a call recording and intelligence tool does not mean that. You have coaching culture. Uh, giving recordings of previous calls is not going to help the onboarding. What are the two or three things that you would advise? Hey, here's the routine. Here is the habit that you need to build uh, as a rep to continue to get more value from call recording tools, or even as a manager that they should be working in what capacity to get the value from these tools. Like just having a recording tool and expecting reps to go and listen on their own is not sufficient, but they need to follow these two or three things to get the most value and truly build the culture that an organization have? What would come top of your mind? First thing is, mo- I don't say most, but I'm going to use a blanket statement. Most managers or whatever it is, sales leaders, when they're using call recording tools and they're coaching the reps, they're mostly t- telling them what they should do, like mm-hmm. what they need to improve on. And that's sort of annoying to hear every time you're doing a one-on-one. It's just like, oh, okay, I get it. I didn't do it or whatever. But if you go in showing the rep, hey, you did this and look how great you did it. And let me show you that talk track. And, I'll, and I'm going to share it with the team, that rep, they may not show their face. They'll say something like, oh, thank you. I mean so much. But inside, they're jumping for joy. It's like having, a, I remember when I was a VP of sales and like the CEO was like, by the way, you, we crushed it this quarter all because of you. I was like, oh, I pre- like, great. I'm happy. But inside, I was jumping for joy. And what that does is it boosts morale and confidence and it, that inhibits like positive behavior. And the rep now shows up to the calls more confident. They're, they're they're now even more motivated. They're bought into the culture. They're bought into the coaching. And so the first thing I'd say is spend time catching the reps do something good and then like hype them up for it. Share it with on it. the Slack channel. Talk about it in company me. I did this recently with a, one of uh, this uh, AE. She had a, a call. It was a discovery, a 45-minute discovery. It was supposed to be a demo, but it ended up being a 45-minute discovery. It was one of the best discovery calls I heard. And I thought she was more SMB, but... I realized from that discovery call, her skill set is enterprise. She like killed it. And I that entire call, I found like maybe 12 talk tracks that I created snippets for that I just shared with the team. And uh, and I when I shared it with the team, I tagged her. I'm like, she did an amazing job. The next, that that meeting ended. She had a follow-up call with a new lead. She was on it. I was like, whoa. And that's because wow. she felt happy and confident. So that's the first thing I do. Use it to build the confidence, not necessarily the improve um the other thing i'd recommend is when you're doing one-on-ones or you're coaching a discovery or coaching next steps or deal call recording software alongside the playbook what i mean by that is if you're coaching them on a skill let's just say next steps take the talk track of next steps play it with them on the call or you tell them hey rep you know what pull up the call that you had last week uh, you sort of guide the rep to log in to your gong to your voma and you have them use the software and then you tell them, all right, I did this the other day. Pull up, pull up. I want to show you something. Pull up the playbook and go to the next, the chapters of next steps. 
they're going, you're guiding them and they're actually using the playbook themselves. Um, they're, they're, you're creating more engagement, just like you would on a demo. Sometimes yeah. I like to give mouse control to the prospect on a demo because it yeah. gets them more, more sticky. I'm doing the same thing with a rep. So that's, that's another thing I'd recommend doing. I love it. Uh, first feedback that, that you mentioned that the coaching is call recording is not just to f- identify the problems to improve, but also give them confidence that they're doing few things really good as well. Um, I have been broken record. You know, you you assume the the good things were table stake and you try to find only the problems. And I've given this problem feedback to some of my reps early on. So this was a very eye-opening and uh, insightful learning. The last question I'm going to ask you, um, you see a lot of other coaches and advisors who are giving advice on LinkedIn and YouTube. What is the most common advice that you're seeing that people still believe in that you disagree with? And uh, you would want to, you would probably not talk about it on LinkedIn, take a fight with them, that this is completely utter bullshit. But then you say that, no, this is where what they are advising, you don't agree with it. And now you think that this is where the world will the world is changing and this is how it should be doing things differently. What would be that thing? There is something that comes to mind. It's, I, I, and I have no problem sharing this on LinkedIn. I actually plan on sharing it on LinkedIn. And I don't think it's going to cause, I don't think it's going to ruffle feathers, but I do have an idea that will ruffle feathers. Um, well, this, this first idea is when everyone's talking about like building pipeline and prospecting, et cetera, everyone's talking about like, oh, you got to personalize the email and make it more relevant. And that's how you can increase your reply rates, blah, 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 blah. The problem is they're trying to, Old prospect in order to build build familiarity when mm. what they should be doing is they should first build familiarity in order to cold prospect so i'll give you an example if me and you engage on linkedin for a while and you see my name you're liking my post i'm liking your post not too no, not, not not crazy you're not like for yeah. you a couple of weeks whatever it is and then i cold email you and i say hey dt it's more from linkedin number one you're going to open that up that email number two you're probably going to respond to that email because you're familiar with me first yeah. And everyone's teaching how to draft the proper email and keep it short and tight and co- keep it, you know, like conversational. Yeah, sure. But I can, I've written emails. I can show you. I have no problem showing you. I've written email that's like an essay freaking long, like this long. <laughs> and I got a reply rate within a minute with a CRO of a company. And she says, wow, this was fantastic. And it was because I engaged with her on LinkedIn prior to sending the cold email. I engaged her for like a couple of weeks, building my name with her. When I sent it, she knew who I was. So I love this. I love yeah. this. Build a, there's a warm up phase, familiar, build the familiarity before you do the cold. So it doesn't become a cold. It becomes a warm yep. outreach to some extent. Let's end with that. Once again, more, uh, we ran longer, but I didn't want to pause because there was so much nuggets of information across the board. I'm going to definitely take lots of notes and share those insights with the team as well here um, and share it on our podcast as well. So You're thank right. you once again. If people want to reach out to you, how should they connect with you? They can connect with me on LinkedIn. And if you're an account executive and you want more coaching, then you can check out uh, demo to close.com and go to the training section. I have a, a coaching program. We have live weekly coaching with me. I'm your coach with course content and a private community with AEs that are all crushing it. I love it. Thank you again, More. Yeah, you bet. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.